Before we get started with today's show, remember, Jalen and Jacoby, the after show continues this Sunday following Lance Part 2 as they speak to director Marina Zinovich. Lance is an ESPN 30 for 30 film on Lance Armstrong's rise and fall in the sports world. Hear from Armstrong himself in a film that insists the audience make its own interpretation of one of the biggest doping scandals in history. If you missed part one of Lance, it's available to stream on ESPN+. Plus. You can download and subscribe to Jalen Jacoby, The After Show, now as well as download and subscribe to The Right Time on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Right Time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening wherever you get your podcast. Rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe you are a hater. We are done with the book club, so we're back on regular schedule. Thursday's the time we have a guest. And joining us now, uh, I just want to let everybody know, I guess they know now that he's growing out his hair. He actually is white. Uh, you can check him out on First Things First, mornings during the week at Fox Sports 1. His name is Nick Wright. I mean, dude, I swear, I had my brother, who has met you, and he's like, he's like, like, not at all. Like, nah, man, nah, man. He's just white dog. Just regular old boring white guy, Nick Wright. <laughs> Bo, how the hell are you, man? For the audience that doesn't know, you and I became friends five years or four years before we ever lived in the same city. Like, I think we had hung out once or twice in person by the time I considered you a really good friend. And then we ended up moving within 900 yards of each other yes i made it a little bit harder by then moving about 25 blocks north of that but up until the pandemic i would say you are the person outside of my immediate family that i saw the most and now i haven't seen you once so it's great to actually talk to you my man i know dude i had to get like i got a bike now so i could like push up there and come hang out because that's the thing man i ain't jumping in no car right Unless the car is owned by somebody I know driving the car, and even that is limited because, you know, pandemic, you don't, mm-hmm. you, don't, you don't know who got it. You don't know who does not. But no, nah, this is it's actually funny because we met through somebody that neither of us <laughs> with no more. Right. And, yeah. And, oh, you know, true. Right. And so, that's true. I didn't even think about that. That was the initial. Yeah, that's correct. Yes. True story. And then we ended up hanging out when the All-Star game, basketball All-Star game was in Houston. Correct. And that's where I met Vinny, yep. Vincent Goodwill, who I had never met before. And now Vinny comes on the TV show occasionally and gives his terrible basketball. <laughs> <laughs> that's just because Vinny be pushing back at you on this LeBron. That's the only reason you say that. Well, the, uh, yeah, that's mostly it. Yeah, that's mostly it. <laughs> no, but it's it's a thing. We watch football on Sundays. Like, we've wanted to try to get this on, but your schedule has not been conducive to recording at the time that we record. And so now this is a wild thing, man. Like, me and you, we are, like, sports junkie types. Like, this mm-hmm. is this is what we do. We eat, breathe this, and both of us, we're radio guys. And I think that's a distinction in this industry that people don't quite understand is that the radio dudes tend to consume all this stuff a bit more voraciously. And go about it in a different space. You know, doing solo radio, man, you got to do three hours of this, right? Like, you got to figure this out in a different way. And now we don't really have, like, sports for real to talk about. Like, it was really nice of my employers to give us the last dance, though, because y'all was even over there treating it like it was games. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. We, by the way, shout out to your employer for providing immense content for my employer and shout out to Michael Jordan for also just telling some bald faced lies that we knew at the time were obvious lies, which has really helped this extend to where it has become a multi week story. Great job by the folks over there who put that whole thing together. But yeah, I mean, I'm out here. You sent me a text months ago. It might've been over a year ago talking about something we were doing on the TV show, which was the simplicity of the conceit of Nick makes a list like that. We should do it more often. Little did I know that in time of pandemic, that would essentially become the show. (laughs) We need a list. We need a list. There's no Jordan doc. We're not going to argue about Lance Armstrong. So make a list. Hey, Nick, you know, this fake bracket, the NBA might be doing, but they might not be doing. Why don't you just pick all the rounds of it so we can discuss about potential matchups in a bracket that might not actually happen such as life in a pandemic, I suppose. Dude, I'm surprised they even have to ask you. I'm surprised you're not like, hey, guys, I got these lists that I've been over here working on uh, in case you dudes needed a list. Uh, oh, God. I, I'll tell you the, th- the big project I'm working on right now. 
the NBA obviously did its 50 greatest players of the first 50 years. That's what the at 50 list was. Right. And it's now been 25 years. So they're going to come out with a top 75. I, ESPN, I think, did, what did they do, 74? Dude, I think yeah. you guys did yeah, your top we, yeah, Because we had nothing to talk about, so they jumped on it a year early. <laughs> exactly right. Like, let's get to it. So I considered doing something similar. And then I was like, man, I really don't want to be arguing about Paul Arizon. Like, there's an element of this to where I'm like, once we're talking Bill Sharman, and then I found myself, all, like, in my own internal monologue having this discussion, yo, man. George Mikan way underrated. And I'm like, all right, I, I got to stop. I, and so I amended it to the thing I'm working on. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to complete it to my level of satisfaction is the top 50 of the last 50. So basically Kareem to now. So Russell, Wilt, West, Elgin, Oscar, all the, the, all those guys don't get, we don't have to worry about ranking them because it's not, it's Kareem to right now. And that I, that's something that I'm trying to do, but it's hard, man. And it's like, and I will tell you this because you're a sports history junkie. You know what that has crystallized to me more than just about anything? We've talked about that Moses Malone is criminally underrated. Yes. And you know that obviously is a Houstonian, but you know who also I think gets underrated, even though he's wildly famous and iconic, is Dr. J. Because Yo. of what he did in the ABA, and people just don't include it. Right. I think Dr. J, the tricky thing about Dr. J is, he's kind of like Chuck Berry and like all these other types, like the first one, right? And so I think it can be difficult, especially, and this is a subtle thing that I think matters, which is the improvements in camera quality over the years. Like, I wonder what some of those, like, 70s clips would look like if they were in HD and they were capturing a little bit more. Because we can't, when you hear, like, old heads talk about, like, David Thompson, you don't really see it when you watch David Thompson. And I know these old heads aren't lying. And the reason I know they aren't lying is I know what it's like when I try to explain to people what Sean Kemp was, right? And the clips are not going to tell you, but you're going to have to take my word for it, guys. Like this dude here was bananas. And so Dr. J, he's the OG for all of these dudes, right? What like El- Elgin Baylor is like the OG for Dr. J. Yep. And then Dr. J becomes the OG for this whole generation as it becomes more of a perimeter game, you know, as we move on. I think he's one, like, now that you're separating, like, Elgin Baylor out of this, so, like, I don't put him. Rick Barry is way up on the underrated, strictly because people hate him. Hate him. That's right. Which, it's, I don't know what's worse, being historically underrated or everyone in the world acknowledging, well, he's underrated because everyone hates him. <laughs> yes. But damn, like, he's he's famous for two things he doesn't want to be famous for. People underrating him and people not liking him. You mentioned Sean Kemp. This is not at all, I'm not taking a shot at anybody, but I was watching your very successful network the other day. And this is on the heels of, and this was not ESPN's fault, when they do the poll and Michael Jordan wins best college basketball player ever, which made me realize if you put up a poll, who's the best white basketball player ever? Jordan going to win that too. Who's the (laughs) smallest basketball player ever? Jordan going to win that too. And they were doing, it was on the anniversary of the Starks dunk, the iconic Starks dunk. And so they're doing the top 10 playoff dunks ever. And number 10 was the Lister blister, Sean Kemp over Alton Lister and the the histrionics, all of it. And I was like, man, what could be number one? Man, Jordan's weak little baseline dunk over Ewing. I'm like, you got to be kidding me, man. That was number like, one? You're He going to win that too? <laughs> like, he's just going to win it. He, he, we're going to say that's the greatest playoff dunk ever. So I appreciated the list, and it reminded me of some dunks I had forgotten, including a Kobe dunk from the 03 playoffs against the Timberwolves, where he goes baseline, does like the double oh, clutch oh boy, reverse. That. that was I had forgotten about that. That was unbelievable. But when you said Sean Kemp, I immediately thought of the dunk over Alton Lister. Well, the number one playoff dunk, like that Jordan dunk isn't even the number one Bulls dunk in playoff history. I really can't think of anything that's topping the disrespect of Scottie Pippen. Yeah, Yeah, but honestly, I feel like we need to go back and relitigate a lot of things with those 90s Knicks because Scottie Pippen yammed on Ewing, threw him on the ground, put his testicles in his face yeah, and nobody happened. fought. Well, listen, I'm a, I, I'm an extremist on this. I think we might need to relitigate a lot of nineties basketball because it, the nineties were 
overrepresented in that 50 greatest of the last 50 because it's the era we were in. Mm-hmm. And there were no, listen, I think Charles, I again, I'm so you talk about what sports junkies we are. I rewatched, uh, games five and seven of the 93 Western Conference finals the other Phoenix, day. Seattle. Phoenix, Seattle, where Chuck had the best game of his career in game five and then topped it in game seven. Like Charles, I think might be, have become a little underrated and there were obviously amazing, amazing players of that era, but because of the expansion, it was basically one star per team. Like that's why the Bulls and then the Jazz were part part of the reason they were such juggernauts is they were some of the only teams with two Hall of Famers. Like people talk about the Knicks and it's like, man, the second best player on that team was a guy who had to fake a broken wrist in order to not get cut in John Starks when he first came around. And those Pacers teams, folks, I'm sorry, those were not great teams. Like because if your best player's Reggie, it's just hard for me to believe you're a great team with the Davis brothers and the Duncan Dutchman. But yeah, a lot of that, I think we have to revisit a bit. All right. So the Pacers, I'm working on something right now on the Pacers, oh, right? Okay. And so where they get to be interesting is the early part of that nineties run was with Larry Brown as the coach. And there are bonus points for Larry Brown being your coach, right? Because he is to me. Just if we're talking about just coaching basketball, like he's the best ever. Yeah. You take, tell some, tell me you take, give somebody 12 random guys and you got to make them into a basketball team. Larry Brown is that dude. And so I thought that the two teams that he took to the conference finals, uh, the one that, the one that lost to the Knicks and then the one that lost to the Magic, those teams, not really, you know, that good. Now, when you get to that second set of teams, okay. So the, the Larry Bird teams that went to the conference finals three years in a row. Yep. Now we're adding to it. It's Reggie. It's a, it's a better version of Reggie. It's a better version of Rick Smith. Now you're adding like young Jalen Rose, who's like a 20 point a game scorer when he's at age 25. You're adding Mark Jackson, who for what you needed at the time of playing nineties basketball, Mark Jackson is the guy for you to have. You're bringing like Sam Perkins. Yeah. Um, Sam off the bench. Uh, what would he have twists or was it cornrows at that point for Sam? That is a very good question. Cause that was when we started to realize, shall we say how Sam Perkins gets down? Like I felt <laughs> like we got a better handle on his lifestyle as his career went on and he started to give less of a damn. Yeah. <laughs> so that, no, that's, here's the thing about th- those Pacers and I, you could say in a similar way, the Knicks and this is where I should give him credit. Even if they only had the one Hall of Famer, they were really well constructed rosters. Yes. Like you had what you needed to fill out the rest of it. And I think your point about, you know, the aging Mark Jackson still being a weapon, especially until they made it illegal for the 13 yes. second yes. lean or back down. Yes. That is absolutely. I mean, that's a totally fair critique. Yeah. Derek McKee, like, like they had guys, right? Um, yep. I think that if they had won a championship, which would have been asking a lot. We would look at them like it's almost unfair. To, honestly, they would be more in line with like the 2004 Pistons because I'm not as wild about Reggie Miller as other people are. I think you and I are kind of in the same camp. Or yep. I feel like if Reggie Miller has those 25 points in the fourth quarter in game five of the Eastern Conference Finals in 1994 and he has them against the Orlando Magic, Reggie Miller is not going to the Hall of Fame, right? He did it against the Knicks at a time where that mattered very much and it elevated him to the status of clutch player that was then reinforced by what he did in the late nineties, like what he did in 98 against the bulls and stuff like that. Like it then got built up after that. Now, what I think is interesting about the expansion era is we went from a league that at the end of the 1960s only had eight teams to a league that at the end of the 1990s had 29 teams, you know, like the, the league blew up. Now we're at a place where, A, I don't think they'll expand anytime soon, right? I just can't see. There's nowhere else to – there's no cities left to expand to, right? Except if, like, if, Seattle, right? Except Seattle. But if you go to Seattle, you got to move out of one of these little podunk spots that they shouldn't be in as of now, right? right. Or like, Kansas the, City, my hometown, that we yeah. built an arena, and we host a Big 12 tournament once a year in. Middle of downtown. We have an anchor yes. arena. We have no tenant. That was oh, a great job by us. I mean, San Antonio built a dome 30 years ago for a football team that has never <laughs> arrived. <laughs> like, they're like, yeah, we got this. Watch this. They're like, what we need y'all for? We got the Cowboys. Yeah. Sorry, but go ahead. You were talking about expanding. Yeah, but now, like, we're at a real interesting place where we have so many good players in the NBA. Like, this is the difference between now and back in the day is 
Back in the day, if you drafted Anthony Davis, you were going to be a 50-win team within two years and a yep. legitimate cha- have a legitimate chance. Anthony Davis has been as good as we thought he was going to be, and he had to go to the Lakers to really have a chance to win at anything because just having that one guy, it just doesn't matter anymore. Like, I wonder, like, remember David Robinson hit the league, and they got, like, 30-something games better, 35 games better in that one year. Is anybody capable of being that guy that drops off? I don't think so because the league now just has so many good players. So, like, if you do a top 50 in the last 50 years now, it'll look one way. If you, like, waited 25 years, and so this would be the midpoint of that 25-year period, there would be so many dudes from right now who would make that list because there are just so many good players in the NBA now. Well, that's – so some – uh we were talking about this on my radio show, which is we're taking, like, different guys from different eras and saying apex – you know, apex Amari Stoudemire who, by the way, underrated what his actual apex was. He is what best player in the league today. You know what I mean? Apex, like apex Reggie, I think I was asked this, apex Paul Pierce. Is he a top 15 guy? It's close. Like the the best season of Pierce, is he, you know, is that, right now, who's who's 14th? Paul George? Like, so, I mean, we we are, when we are that deep, when a guy like C.J. McCollum probably doesn't make the top 20, I think it speaks to the overall depth of the league. And a huge part of that is the fact that the NBA is is a true global sport. Like, if going into the year, you said, you know, guys who one day will be, you know, Top three MVP vote getters. You could have said a dude from Cameroon, a dude from Nigeria via Greece already did it. If you believe in, uh, Porzingis, a dude from Latvia, like, and I'm leaving out some obvious ones, uh, as far as guys that have come from overseas all over the globe and it, it not only made an impact, but become superstars. When you've got 25% of your top 15 players being guys, that came from places where you couldn't get players previously. I think that's a huge part of it. Yeah, and like you talked about CJ. Oh, Luca, I left out Luca. I apologize. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, you talk about CJ McCollum. You like, um, you know, a guy who might not be a top twenty player. I'm thinking about it. Like, I'm, I would be stunned if he's a top twenty player. And what's crazy, and this is no shade to McCollum, is how easily we could rattle off who those twenty players are because there's so many good dudes in the NBA. Like, you think about this right now. Would you rather have CJ McCollum or uh, Pascal Siakam? Oh, that's close. Siakam's another guy from overseas. Yeah. Uh, I think this moment today, CJ, but I think in like nine months, maybe Siakam, but it's close because Siakam does so much. Yeah. Cause I feel like I take Siakam right now. Like you think about this with the heat, a dude like Adebayo, if we drop Adebayo off 25 years ago, Adebayo is a superhero. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like he, like, and he's what, maybe one of the 30 best players in the NBA, maybe. you know, like what, what are the few guys that can guard, um, Giannis, like that's the big thing with him is that the Heat ever matched up with the book, the Bucks. The Bucks got a problem because they got a dude that can that is strong enough and quick enough to play defense against Giannis. Like we have so many, I just I just find myself blown away so often about like how many players are so good, and I feel like it also has to affect the calculus on the way that we look at dudes when we talk about whether you did or did not win a championship because oh, you being on the team just doesn't mean what it used to. And that's why I've always pushed back against the LeBron needed super teams. Well, okay, listen, uh, on the LeBron stuff, everyone acknowledges the, the, the one thing that LeBron James supporters have the ability to do that Michael Jordan supporters could learn from is acknowledge failures or mishaps. Like, listen, there's no LeBron person out there that's like, you know what? He actually was good in 2011. You know right. what? That Dallas series, you have it wrong. Like, we, the, the, there's the blemish, but every other year you look up at the finals and it's like, oh, that team had four Hall of Famers. That team had three MVPs of the league on it. So you can't eat to your point about just walking into the league and immediately being a 30 game improvement. That's not the NBA we're in anymore. Like D Wade of that great class won first and was the only one to win for a long time, but he had not prime Shaq, but he still had Top five of the MVP voting. In fact, I think Shaq finished second or third his first year in Miami. He still had it's Shaquille O'Neal alongside him. And so it's just, it's a totally different era. And it has, for a guy like James Harden, it, it, it's been, 
I, I think the championship calculus is, and it has become an unfair component to it. Same with Chris Paul. Those are guys who you, when you look at with Chris Paul, his advanced numbers and with James Harden, just the regular counting numbers, you would say, well, these are, we're talking about top 25 all time players, but because neither one has been to the finals at, well, for Chris at all and for Harden, not even as a starter, they get dismissed to a degree. Well, and there's also something that's like fairly ironic, which is in spite of this, you can have a team without a great all-time player, at least in that moment, and win a championship. Like the 2014 Spurs, when you go back and look at it quietly, one of the greatest teams of all time, right? Like you go look at actual performance, you go look at what they did in the playoffs, the way they destroyed the Heat in five games. Yep. Legitimately one of the greatest teams of all time. That team at that point, forget about having a superstar. They didn't even really have a star. Like, that's a very early version of Kawhi Leonard. He got finals MVP because he guarded LeBron so well in a series where LeBron shot almost 60% from the floor. Yep. <laughs> you had old Duncan. You had old Ginobili. You had old Parker. Uh, You got Danny Green, who would have been the MVP of the 2013 finals if the Spurs had somehow managed to pull that one off. But the rules allow it to where you can build a different kind of machine than you used to be able to build before. Because back in the day, it was just going to come down to eventually ISO – Dump it off to somebody. Can you stop him from getting the butt? The only pushback I would have, and this is to me part of Duncan's greatness, is if I'm not mistaken, I think Duncan was first team all NBA that year. So even though he wasn't league MVP 20 and 14 Duncan anymore, he was that season. He was still exceptional, but you're totally right about Kawhi. Kawhi was Ka- Kawhi had single digit points in games one and two of those finals. Games one and two, I think he scored eight points in each game or nine points in each game. Uh, and then obviously he played really well in the final three. And Le- LeBron was held to, as you mentioned, 28 a game on 58% from the field and 52% from three. <laughs> that was my favorite thing. The consecutive finals MVPs, Kawhi wins one for holding LeBron to basically a 60 and 50 percentages. And then the next year, Iguodala earns one. Well, he slowed down LeBron, who averaged 36, 13, and nine in that season. I guess we should settle in a little bit on LeBron because that's kind of, you know, become your thing. I had to hit up Bodie Broaddus to try to hit him up and be like, damn, man, why are you coming at my homie Nick's up like that, man? You know what I'm saying? Oh, my. He, I said all those nice things about him after he crushed me. And I started following him on Twitter, assuming he'd see what a big fan I was, see that my tweets from nine, my, I have a tweet to you nine years ago when you were, I'm sure, just eviscerating Stringer Bell that I found <laughs> that I said I thought Bodie was the best character. And I assumed he'd DM me like, yo, man, all love, you know, just giving you a hard time with the LeBron stuff. Appreciate. Nope. No DM and continues to this moment to respond to folks who tweet to him about me laughing at me. I'm like, oh, my God. This is just brutal. It's just brutal. Passionate. No, no, he, he's passionate on the matter, right? Yeah. Right? Like, 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 like he, 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 he is very serious about this thing. But the Jordan doc was an interesting time to be you on this one. Because I guess I don't have a great handle on where you are on Mike. Because I am on the Mike is the greatest program. Like, I don't think the idea of LeBron is the greatest is totally ridiculous but this jordan was just something that like we just don't have a substitute for it so like where where are you on mike himself so i think it's a great question and i think and this is one of the things that i do think differentiates the folks that are on the lebron side of the argument and some of the folks i'm not talking about you but some of the folks on the jordan side of the argument folks such as myself who think lebron's the greatest player ever all of us say listen You can make a case for LeBron, but the case for Jordan is not a bad one. And I would argue there's a third person who should always be mentioned in Kareem. And I I think that as long as those are your top three, you can make a case for any of them. And it makes sense. I think LeBron's a little bit better. And I think he's done it in a tougher era. And I think he's obviously done it for a longer period of time. What was so fascinating during the Jordan doc was how many of the Jordan folks We're using it as an attempt to bring up LeBron, not the other way around. And one of the big distinctions is there are a lot of Jordan folks 
that are still on the, is LeBron actually even top five? In fact, when you think about it, he's behind Kobe. In fact, when you really think about it, I'm not sure if he's top 10. Nobody does that to Mike. Now, one could argue you don't do it to Mike because you can't. I would argue you don't do it to Mike because you can't, but you also can't do it to LeBron. But it's just a very different, uh, some of the Jordan folks are offended that it's a discussion. And another thing your network did that I thought was really interesting was that poll, the when it was 76% of the public says Michael Jordan's the greatest player ever. And we talked about it on my television show. And it was phrased to me as like that I should be wounded by it. And I said, I'm going to be honest with you. I look at that as a massive success for me personally. Because <laughs> I believe that when I said LeBron's the greatest player ever, which was June of 2016 after Game 7 against the Warriors, I think that was a 2% opinion. I think the furthest anyone was going out on the ledge was LeBron maybe one day will be. And the fact that now one in four basketball fans are like, no. It's not Jordan. I feel like we're pacing the way a marijuana legalization paced. It was like 5% support. Then all of a sudden it was 35% support. And before you know it, once they win this title and the next one, it will be like 65%. Yeah. You say, let this go a little bit longer. It'll be like if you and LeBron got married. Oh my. Okay. That's you got to admit, you got to admit that was, that was well played. That was well played. You, I saw the twinkle in your eye that you had a, you had a nice little zinger coming for me. That's, hey, man. That's well done. It. Gradual progress, baby. Gradual, Gradual progress. progress. Gradual Absolutely. progress. Absolutely. Yeah, well done. <laughs> See, I think also this is where this gets interesting because you and I are about five years apart in age. I'm five years older. Yep. And those five years matter a lot in the course of this discussion because it affects the way that you consume Michael Jordan, right? Yep. So, like, I don't remember a world without Michael Jordan, but I do remember a world before Michael Jordan was the champion. Like I remember a world before everything like around Mike was built. You were kind of born into the world, at least in terms of like having awareness and being old enough to like really grasp what's going yep. on. First NBA finals I vividly remember are Bulls Lakers. Like yeah. the first Super Bowl I vividly remember is the I I call it the Art Monk Super Bowl. Washington Buffalo like yeah. that 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 very very early 90s are the first times I so you're right I have no recollection of Jordan getting beat by the Pistons because I was too young to be yeah. I guess forming memories yeah he's the establishment to you you know yep. like he he is that which you have inherited and in a small way that kind of applies to me also but like with LeBron I remember like around 09 08 09 in there I was on the LeBron's the best player I've ever seen. And I had very technical arguments that could back it up. I was like, name, what is it that Jordan does better than LeBron? Right. Like, and I could go through and I could get this long list of everything it was that LeBron does. Jordan takes me to a place that makes me somewhat uncomfortable, which is that I don't get too deep into touchy feelies in making analysis, but there is something to this. I am a sociopathic killer thing that has real benefits. Yes. Uh, to being an NBA player, it, it helps. It goes places and he weaponizes that in a way that at the margins, it winds up mattering. I think so that's I, the best way to put it. I, I agree with that. I also agree that Jordan has the best story. Like this is why it was good that Phil walked away and didn't come back. Because I don't believe the Bulls in 99 were going to win a title. Now, I do think they could have gotten there. My, the damn Knicks got there as an eight seed. So you assume the Bulls make the playoffs. Knicks missed the playoffs. Though I think they could have gotten there. I don't think they would have had an answer for Duncan and Robinson. Pip wouldn't have been there. Rodman wasn't the same guy. So even if on the strength of Jordan alone they get there. But... And I would have found that, listen, I'm, I'm of the belief that winning as much as you can win, it always helps you. I know some people are of the belief if you're going to lose, the worst thing you can do is lose in the championship round as opposed to an earlier round. Right. I, I, I don't buy that logic, but it, listen, Michael Jordan was considered the greatest closer and most clutch player ever. And that was before he hit the walk off jump shot in his final game with the Bulls to wrap up his sixth title. Like, I, the story of Michael Jordan and the legend, that to me is almost an unclimbable mountain. I don't know how someone can overcome that part of it. And so I don't, I don't disagree with that. And your point, Bo, that it, there was to me a very interesting conversation about Jordan's leadership style. 
And it seems like people were on one of two sides. One was, this is horrifying. And the other one was, this is the only way to win. And I, I haven't heard your take on this. And I'm curious to. I think both are wrong. And by that, I mean, it's obviously not the only way to win. Duncan has five rings and led a totally different way. But it's also, in the context of sports, it's not horrifying. It might be mean, but there, I don't like when college coaches grab the player's face mask. I don't, wouldn't mind so much if pro coaches did it. Like I, I think there is an element of sports have at least this kind of relation to boot camp military. I'm going to kick your ass if you don't do what I need you to do. And I do think there's a place for that in sports, even in 2020. I don't know where you stand on it. So. I have to admit, I found myself judging people to a degree based on how they responded to this stuff with Jordan. Because honestly, what I saw in the doc wasn't that bad. There are other Michael Jordan stories that I think are probably worse than these, right? Where I am kind of like, yo, okay, you went too far. The stuff that was in the documentary, like I did not see Scott Burrell and see a guy who was terrorized at work every day. You know, now I don't think... Like, Jordan out here calling him a and stuff like that. Like, Scott, you ain't got to take that. Like, I do feel like one of the morals of the story of the documentary that got lost was you don't have to take this. The guys that pushed back at Mike were the guys that ultimately got Mike's respect. But I also had to acknowledge that where my judgment for people was coming up was I don't relate to people getting pushed around, right? Like, I was not watching that and seeing myself in the place of Steve Kerr or seeing myself in the place of Scott Burrell. I wasn't. And so I'm looking at those dudes, and I'm like, don't you hear these other guys saying that they push back at Mike, and that once they push back at Mike, it got better? You know, like, I didn't see anything that was terribly horrifying, particularly for that line of work coming out of Jordan. At the same time, I don't know if his approach was necessarily the most effective, because you got all these guys who do ultimately want to please you. And so you kind of want to terrorize them into pleasing you rather than encouraging that that's not your that's not your approach that's not the way you do it LeBron bit more of an encourager when it comes to that like I talked to Chotner at the New Yorker and I talked about this that LeBron's more like old buddy from the sandlot who tells the kid to go stand in right field oh, and stand yeah. right there and hold your glove up right Mike on the other hand is you better figure out a way to catch the ball you know like like it's it it it, it runs different Magic Johnson is interesting because he is a guy who was like a hybrid of those two um, in the approach that he had with players. But I thought that Mike made a very compelling point, and this to a degree I relate to, and I'm not Michael Jordan, but for him, being on the team is like the ultimate group project. And he is the guy in the group. That's the reason why we can get an A. And if you see students get a C on this project, everybody's just going to say, yeah, but you a C student. But if Mike comes out here and only gets a C on this, everybody's going to come up to Mike and be like, so what's going on with you? You falling off. Like, what's it going to be? Da, da, da. Everything else, right? If they get the A, it's because of what Mike did. And everybody else winds up getting the A and they get to skate by on the A. And Mike is looking at them like, yo, you can make sure we get this A by doing your damn job. Like the weight on him is so much greater than the weight on everybody else. And everybody else gets to capitalize on this. Bill Winnington, for example, does Bulls games, right? You think he, that happens if he's not on the Michael Jordan no, of team? Of course not. No. Everything right. about Steve Kerr, being on the Bulls matters a lot and helps a lot toward building the legend of Steve Kerr yep. that gets him to the place that he is in. Up and down, Stacey King, he's doing Bulls games. Like all these guys have capitalized off the fact that they play with Michael Jordan. And if I'm Jordan, you damn well better be working as hard as I work out here trying to get this done because y'all are winning based on what I do. And so I could understand his frustrations, even if he did it the wrong way. I don't think enough people watched that and gave enough credence to the truth that it is something different for Michael Jordan than it is for everybody else. But I think that is a position that most people cannot relate to because they have never been asked to carry something with stakes. Right. And the group project thing, I feel like is a very personal one for you. Cause I feel like that was the position you found yourself in quite a bit. My guess, I wasn't the type of student you were, but the, the, you, you were a guy that you have postgraduate degrees. You're very, very good at school. And I could imagine there was times for you either in college or before or in grad school 
where it's like, God dog it. Like I either a B on this thing's gonna raise your grade and it's gonna kill mine. Yep. So like what are we actually <laughs> shooting for here? Right. So like I get that part of it. Think about this in a way that I think is easier to relate to for you personally, and I think that people will get in a different way. You and I have hosted radio shows by ourselves, right? The only thing anybody really sees on that radio show is the host. It's you. If something doesn't go right, if you call for the sound and the sound ain't there or whatever it is, it's coming down on you because your name is the one yep. that is on the marquee, right? And I don't know much about how like you deal with your staff and stuff generally, but like I am personally very conscientious and concerned in dealing with people about like, I don't want to seem like this terrorizing. Basically, I don't want to seem like people say Michael Jordan seems, you know? You know what happens as a result? And this is not Gabe, just to be clear. Things fall by the wayside. Yeah, things fall by the wayside. And you sit there just like, so what am I supposed to do here, right? I'm going to hurt y'all's feelings. And Mike is like, well, I guess I'm just going to hurt your feelings. So that is, and I want to make a Phil Jackson point, but that is, it is so funny you use that example. Because I was talking about this with a guy who you may or may not have met, a guy named Mark Carmen who does radio in Chicago now. Uh, I was at his wedding six months ago. During the toasts at his wedding, Michael Jordan's name was mentioned seven times. He's that type of Michael Jordan sycophant. He's the, he's <laughs> older than you. Like he, he was there for the whole run, all of it. And I was tweaking a bit Jordan's leadership style and Carm before he did radio in Chicago was my radio producer and update guy. And he started laughing and he said, Nick, he said, you know what I thought of when I was watching Jordan's leadership style? I said, what? He's like, the way you were early on in Kansas City when we would screw things up. And I had this moment. I was like, oh. Now, I wasn't cursing people out right. and calling them out their name. But I was like, oh, that's kind of a fair point. I did feel like all of this is going to fall on me if it doesn't work. So get your stuff together, guys. And I yeah. was maybe a little more uh, you know, high strung than I try to be now. The other, the Phil Jackson board I wanted to make that I wanted your opinion on was listen, Phil obviously was a bad GM and the stuff with LeBron and the posse stuff is just repugnant. Yeah. But my God, was he the perfect coach for that team? I feel. And I think yeah. some of Phil's personality allowed Jordan to be his full version of himself because Phil was so different. And yep. the fact that like Phil was able to reach even Jordan where Jordan is writing damn poetry at the end <laughs> of the thing, like it does speak to his brilliance as a leader of a group of very specific personalities. Well, let's extend that a little because the Phil part I think is important um, in talking like, like the point you make there that Phil allowed Mike to be the guy he was and then bring it all together because the point of comparison you made was Tim Duncan. And that's one that Pablo had made. And I sent him a text about it. And I was like, here's the thing about Duncan. Duncan led in that way. But Popovich was Jordan. Yep. Popovich is the one that's screaming at everybody, right? And the reason that it worked in San Antonio was Steven Jackson has to deal. Like, I forget, somebody wrote a story. I can't remember who the person was, but they made a point about it where they're like, what are you going to say if he's Tim Duncan, right? Like, if Tim Duncan's over here and he's got to put up with this, then everybody else has to. So Duncan became like the Phil player in the sense that he then allowed Popovich to be this other guy. Like, I don't think that you need somebody around to terrorize people because I acknowledge that, like, for me, that is not what I respond to. You know, like, you're not you're not going to get the most out of me under those circumstances. But some people do, right? Like, some people do kind of need a push. The question is, like, the philosophical question is whether or not the bottom line justifies what it takes to get there. Not whatever it takes to get there, because obviously whatever is too far. But at what point is this very rare circumstance and situation and where we got to be at the end? Where does it get it to a place where sometimes some people need to hear that, like, yo, you're this up right now and you're going to this up for everybody. Can you or can you not say that? Who is the right person? Like all of these things come into play. But when the stakes get as high as this, I do think people need to understand that the game's going to be a little bit different. And and it's an unprovable hypothetical, but. To bring it back to LeBron for a moment, let's take my guy JR. So I think some people would say, man, if JR had the fear of LeBron 
that some of Jordan's teammates had of him, he might not forget that score. Like, maybe he has a little more attention detail. And that might be true. What's also true, though, is if JR has the fear of LeBron instead of believing they are, you know, equals to a degree in the respect and friendship, he might not take those two enormous shots that he took at the beginning of the second half of Game 7 in 2016 that kept the Cavs in it. You know what I mean? So, like, they, if he didn't feel totally comfortable, make or miss, we're all on the same side, maybe he doesn't take those shots, and that goes a different way. And if he's terrified for his life, then maybe at the very least he remembers when George Hill misses the free throw in 2018. It's a tie game, not that we're up by one. So, I mean, with Jordan, one of the reasons that's kind of impenetrable to if you want to defend his style is because they always won. Like they no, but once they started winning, aside from the year that nobody counts but me against Shaq and Penny and Nick Anderson, <laughs> they always won. And so it's like, well, you can't in 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 a zero or a you know a business where there is one definitive winner at the end of every season. If it's always you guys, then I guess it worked as well as it possibly could have. Right, and I think the other dilemma with this when we talk about player leadership and that, I mean, this is a thing that gets lost. Like it works out well in football because quarterback is this distinct position. So it creates like a hierarchy of management in that way. But the star player doesn't actually have any authority, right? Like as much as people like Michael go upstairs and get you traded, Jerry Krause made it very clear that he didn't make trades or do anything because Michael Jordan wanted it to be done. Right. And so the guy in that place, and this is kind of similar to being a radio dude, right? You kind of have authority over the producer, but you don't really have authority over the producer. You're not the producer's boss. You both actually have the same boss, but you are kind of in charge. And so like where the middle ground comes in on how you deal with the people who are on the same level as you in theory, but are actually below you. That's where it gets hard. Because the thing about like Mike terrorizing those people is, again, not all of them going to feel like they can push back because you are Michael Jordan, even though. You can push back because he is a guy on your team. Like, where does that start? Where does that end? LeBron becomes interesting to me because LeBron wants to establish on levels that, hey, I am a guy on the team and we are all in this together. And he's also the dude that like shows up to everything late because he can because he's LeBron James. And a guy who might actually be able to trade you. Yes. Yes. There is that. Like, and will. Yeah, right, and will. And it's shown the willingness to, you know, move on from guys maybe earlier than they wanted to be moved on from. And, you know, and by the way, I don't think LeBron's trading you because he doesn't like you. Like, I don't think he's that right. guy. I think he's trading you if he likes you and you just got to be traded. Yep. Or if he just likes somebody a hell of a lot more. Yes. Like, I don't think he disliked Lonzo, but you gots to go, man. Sorry. <laughs> Well, what Lonzo never did was present a compelling reason to stay. Exactly right. Right. LeBron looked up and down at that roster and said, whatever you got to do. Yep. <laughs> whatever you got to do. There's nobody there that he wanted to fight over. Like there, there was the, and to be fair, also, there was nobody on that roster that I saw and thought, no, got to keep him. And to be fair, he was right. Yes. Like it, uh, and we'll see how this season ends up playing out. But credit to Palinka for, you know, kind of fixing around the edges once Kawhi ended up not coming. But they, it's not like they have a superstar cast around those two guys. LeBron was right. Like, just don't put a bunch of, don't do what Magic did and be like, Lance Stevenson's are our future. Get me Anthony Davis and we'll figure it out. Yep. Yeah. Hey, I still say for Magic, Magic was like, look, my job is to get Anthony Davis here. I did my job. Yep. That's true. Hey. Thanks for stopping by the booth. Like y'all say whatever y'all want about me. The, what I realized that people were doing magic a little wrong, and I hadn't even thought about this because you kept hearing about that day of Zubats, Zubats, Zubats. Magic came on first take. It was like, how many points a game Zubats average? Four. Okay. The problem is he traded him for maybe the worst player I've ever seen play minutes for a team trying to get in the ball. Who is that guy? Big white guy who was trying to, who said he was a three point shooter. Oh my God. I was so annoyed last year when I thought the Lakers were going to sneak into the playoffs. Muscala. Oh, yeah. Uh, Mike Muscala. Muscala is like, oh, we got a shooter. And I'm like, this guy, maybe he used to be a shooter, but he ain't right now. That's for damn sure. <laughs> and then we found out his daddy was wilding on Twitter. Oh, yeah. That happened, too. We'll be back in a minute with more Nick Wright. But first, don't you think some once in a blue moon moments should happen more than once in a blue moon? Like catching up with friends you don't see all the time, checking out one of your favorite artists live in concert? 
Blue Moon is on a mission to celebrate and inspire more of those moments. Just like those looking for the special in the everyday, Blue Moon takes a twist on the traditional Belgian wit. Blue Moon was created during the 1995 baseball season at the Sandlot Brewery at Coors Field in Denver, Colorado. Blue Moon founder and brewmaster was inspired by the flavorful Belgian wits he enjoyed while studying brewing in Brussels. Valencia orange peel for a subtle sweetness and a coriander balance with oats that create a smooth, creamy finish. It brings a one-of-a-kind appearance and bright taste. Why the name Blue Moon? As someone was tasting the beer, they said, a beer this good only comes around once in a blue moon. Once in a blue moon should happen more than once in a blue moon. So whenever you reach for a blue moon, be reminded of the extraordinary. So the next time you have a socially distant meetup with friends or just enjoying a night in, reach for a blue moon. It's the beer you can enjoy every day. You can have blue moon delivered by going to get.bluemoonbeer.com and finding delivery options near you. Blue moon, reach for the moon. Great responsibly. Blue Moon Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado, A-L-E. That kind of reminds me. I want to like, you know, our bosses will be okay. We're both responsible people. You know, you and I got reputations there for a while as being like rabble rousers out here in Mm -hmm. this space, in the sports. And I have always contended, and I'm curious your thoughts on this. We were talking about what the news was, right? Like when Colin Kaepernick was the news and Colin Kaepernick was the story, we responsibly talked about Kaepernick and with the appropriate context that mattered with Kaepernick. And I have found that since then, we really haven't had stories break out that like intersected sports in that way that involved, you know, the discussion of some of those social factors. That being said, uh, what's going on in Minnesota, it seems like every time we try to get out, they pull us right back in and it's on fire up there. And people in sports seem to be now getting on this and talking about it. And I'm curious your thoughts, not even necessarily so much about like the issue itself but our me like as an industry if this becomes a thing that you know we don't have any sports on the field right now let's keep that part in mind right we don't have other stuff to talk about how are we going to handle something like this if it comes in our sports world and we have to well i think it's a really interesting question and an additional part of it is you know someone that you and i both have a personal relationship with steven jackson yes evidently was very close with this man I was late to recognizing that because I'm not on Instagram the way a lot of people I, – I am on Instagram, but I'm not regularly on it the way I'm on Twitter. And I saw the picture, and I thought like a lot of people was like, man, he looks so much like Stack. I didn't realize until yesterday that he and Stack knew each other from Houston, that they had had a relationship. And listen, the obvious point is this is quite literally – exactly what Colin Kaepernick was kneeling about. And the fact that this murder took place via kneeling is some of the most cruel irony imaginable. I I have, now maybe this comes from a place of privilege, I don't know, about not feeling the need to speak out continuously on every one of these horrible instances. I did a big thing about Ahmaud Arbery on the radio show, and I wasn't sure if I was going to talk about this yesterday, even though this, I guess, has more of a closer connection to sports than Ahmad did. Uh, but part of it, Bo, is because I don't think anyone actually disagrees with what Cap was saying happened. I think people only disagree about whether or not they think it's a problem, which is what makes these discussions so tough because we listen, there is over whether you want to use anecdotal video or statistical evidence. We know cap was right. The issue is how many people and is it a disproportionate number of sports fans or is it the regular population? I don't know. See it and say, yeah, but that's that's actually what my tax dollars are supposed to go to. And it makes it I at one point in time felt like I need to I have an obligation to talk about this as often as possible because I have a platform and I need to try to use it to affect change, to change some people's minds. And now and maybe this is defeatist and maybe it's the easy way out. Now I've kind of come to the conclusion, like, ain't no minds being changed. 
People have seen all the videos. They have all the facts. It's whether or not you think it's a problem. And unfortunately, I don't think it's a majority of people or a majority of white people, but it's not a negligible amount of people see this and say, yeah, sounds about right. And so, and that, if we're going to kind of go really branch off for a moment, that is why the, all the Karen videos on Twitter, while some of them are amusing, I'm not going to lie. Some of them are actually kind of hilarious. It also is a very honest window into the mentality of a lot of the people who I used to spend time on and have my hairs turn gray arguing with on Twitter, which is the belief that the police's number one job is to respond to the complaints of white people directed predominantly or primarily towards non-white people. And if police are not around, white people can just substitute as their proxies. I want to know why you're here. I want to know why you're talking to me that way. And I do think there's a lot of people that say, yep, sounds good to me. And it's tough to have those conversations, at least to me. So I don't know. Yeah, like 2016 was the moment that I was kind of like, oh, okay, so I'm not changing people's minds. I'm just out here endangering my safety and my livelihood and not changing minds. But see, but also what I realized too, I'm not changing minds. And I still have, like, things come up, I still talk about it, but I feel like the social media space in particular is no longer about dialogue. It's now about projection. It is everybody individually branding themselves. And so since it is simply about projection that I don't need to perform on this. You know what I mean? I don't need to, my, my, my bona fides are solid. I don't need to declare where I stand on this matter. And I found myself over and over again, just kind of saying the same thing. And with 2016, I really hit a point. And I think it's what you said there, basically, where it's just like, oh, okay. So y'all know what the deal is here. Y'all just go ride it out. Oh, okay. This is right. You know what I mean? Like this is, this is what it is. This is, this is kind of sort of what you want it to be. And as like the social media space got less safe, I pulled back on doing those things. Right. But I also find like now what I'm kind of doing, I guess it all depends on what I'm working on. So I did a parting shot um, a couple of weeks ago about Tom Brady um, putting his name on the players coalition letter about Ahmaud Arbery, which I thought was very important because, you know, he's on there. Stan Van Gundy's on there. Steve Kerr's yeah. on there. Like there's a lot of guys and it's important that white people of visibility and of repute engage in these activities because white people will listen to white people except white people are demonstrating that like even if it's tom brady okay we just go act like that didn't happen right like it's that not- was interesting you're right the, the, the tom brady you're gonna act like it didn't happen and i want to give credit i didn't see the full clip but i saw a bit of it today jj watt spoke out against this now listen yeah. it's an obvious if you see what happened to george lloyd and you're like i don't see the problem you're just a bad person. So it's not like it's a hard stance to say that was horrifying, but it is a stance white athletes are not asked to take very often. And it's why to go back to the cap thing, I was so disappointed that we didn't have a single white quarterback that was going to kneel with it. And now like, listen, in my head, I would have. If I'm actually, I can't say for definitively I would have if I were in their position, but I feel like I would have. But I feel, it seems like the there were only two white football players that kneeled, and both of them were in the situation I'm in, which is... <laughs> They're both married to black women. Married to black <laughs> women. And, and, and which, again, like, I'm not, I think that you can get down a very dangerous and problematic thought process if you talk about what listen I'm no matter who I'm married to who my family is I still walk around a white man in America I get that but I do think once you start having fear for your own blood or your own family in a way that you didn't I'll tell a quick story that you've probably heard and I apologize if this is not the direction you wanted to go we were living in Houston in a white suburb you know the area in Sugarland you've been to the house when the George Zimmerman verdict. So when that comes down, it was the first time my wife saw me cry. And she was seemingly unfazed by it. And we had a son, we have a son, but at the time, about the same age that Trayvon was then. And I, she, she was like, you know, what's wrong? And I 
said basically all the things I was feeling, how afraid I was, how angry I was, all these things. And I said to her, I was like, why is this hitting me so differently than you? And she had a quote I'll never forget. She said, baby, I've been black for 30 years. Her words, not mine. She's like, you've been black for five. Like, and I, and I'm not, and I'm not saying that, but the point was like, I had taken on the, the weight of having to worry about these things, not only being horrible and being tragedies, but touching me and my, and my family. And a guy I used to do radio with guy, really, really smart guy named Scott Geiger. He said that he, he's a big gun control guy. And he said that, you know, Newtown was not the beginning of the gun control debate. It was the end of it. Because once we said we can abide of 27 preschoolers being murdered, like then we can abide anything. And that's how I actually felt and feel about one that gets forgotten by a lot of people. But Tamir Rice, once we can abide by the police rolling up on a public park before the car's even done moving, shooting a 13-year-old boy, lying about it, there being video, and just keep it rolling, cuffing the mom when she, or the sister when she comes out, all of it. To me, that was, and that was years ago, that was when it's like, okay, you know, folks aren't going to have their minds changed on it. it I do agree with you. It is still important for folks with a position of power, whether it's because they're celebrity athletes or whatever, to still bring it to light. I can't kill myself arguing with folks on the internet about it anymore. And I also think it's swung in this direction where the folks who are most likely to be like, what happened to George Lloyd is awful. But those folks, I think, for one reason or another, have more latitude right now on social media to leave sports than you or I do. Yeah, and I I wonder as an industry, right, like as media – if it's possible that something can happen that is similar to Kaepernick that becomes impossible to avoid, right? So, like, you can ignore Tom Brady putting his name on that letter, and you can ignore, if you want, whatever Steve Kerr says on Twitter, which is actually becoming very interesting because Steve Kerr is talking very pointedly to white people and not really in these yep. amorphous, you know, kind of what, what's going on, to say in America type terms. Like, he's come to a different place. But I'm really curious to see what our industry is going to do if something happens surrounding this that cannot be ignored. Like, I don't know if you saw this, but the president of the University of Minnesota just oh, said man. they will no longer contract. And I'm trying to explain to people on Twitter what a defiant move that is. They're like, oh, well, they can just call another police department. Do you understand how police departments work? Right? Like, like it's it's all the police. I can't it believe they did it. I can't, yeah. I'm not saying they're wrong. I cannot believe they did it. That's stunning. The and president of the University of Minnesota said we're not going to use the Minnesota yeah. cops anymore. I can't and believe look, it. And look, man, if there is a football season, this can be a thing like this can be an issue that can happen and involve demonstrations at stadiums and everything else. Like, I mean, I really think that this could, I'm not saying it will be, but this could prove to be something of that level of magnitude. This president could wind up getting fired. And then that ties into everything with sports and all of this. What would have to happen with this to make it such that it cannot be ignored? Because again, we don't have anything to talk about over here. And on the news side, they ain't really got nothing to talk about, but the same thing they've been talking about for three months. Right, so to make sure I understand the question, what would have to happen to make the specific what happened right. to George become something that comes to us or where we're talking about this epidemic? Or it could be generally, right? So with George Floyd, I do wonder like what it can be with, you know, what, what with that case can happen. But I also feel like we saw the last time that this level of energy was building up around these kinds of cases. It ain't hard to find another one. This happens all the time, right? Like we could be in a second building action in a place similar to where we were from like 2012 to 2014, where I contend our industry couldn't ignore that stuff. It wasn't about everybody getting woke. It was just that everything was there. And I do kind of wonder Given just generally the tension and anxiety that people have, it's an election year. You got the stuff going outside with the virus. I feel like we may wind up in a place where everybody that thinks that we got too woke for our own good before is going to realize, no, nah, that was just the news. Well, so I agree with you that that was just the news. Honestly, in order for this to be a topic that gets the Kaepernick style coverage where it is the lead because it's the news, I hope to God this doesn't happen. But I think what happened to Thabo Cephalosha would have to happen to a star and there would have to be video of it. And Thabo Cephalosha, if people don't remember, three, four years ago, through no fault of his own, 
I think it was in New York City, but a police took a baton to his leg because he wasn't listening the way they wanted him to. Yeah, broke his leg right before the playoffs. Right before the playoffs. Meanwhile, Pero Antich, who looks literally looks just like a movie supervillain, he was he was right there with him. <laughs> Nothing happened to him. Um, and I think you would need one of these gross instances of obvious police misconduct on an active athlete. There was also a, who was it? There was, I feel like there was a Minnesota NBA player who parked in a handicap spot. Oh, that was in Milwaukee. Shannon Brown's brother, Sterling. Okay. Sterling Brown. Exactly right. I think it would have to be famous player on video, obvious, like no questions about misconduct. I think because if that happened, I think you would have a sustained outrage and response by athletes. And ultimately, that's what makes it to where in our business, even the folks that want to avoid these things at all costs, they can't. You know what I mean? Like if all of a sudden, if you've got the guys we spend all our time talking about or the other option is. And the the less horrifying one is if some of our white star athletes start being as vocal about it as some of our black star athletes are. If if Steve Kerr's Twitter becomes Tom Brady's, then yeah, then I, you know what I mean. Like it, it can't just be Kerr and Pop as the guys. I think I think that also would create the opening, so to speak. Maybe Daryl Morey will send a tweet hashtag I stand with Minneapolis. Yeah, you know where what? he at. You know what? Where, 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 where he at right now? You're, I know. you're really putting me in a bad spot. No, no, there. I'm not. Go, I'm not going to put you in a bad spot there. I am going to say this because Daryl has to be aware of this. When Fertitta went up there to the White House and got to talking about Daryl, Daryl had to be like, "Damn, ain't you got more important things to worry about right now?" I thought we had gotten through this. I thought I had moved on. Everybody's gone on, and I come to find out that you, Tilbert Fertitta, you still think about this. Every single day. Speaking of the president, people loved the golf match the other day, the yeah. whatever it was called. I loved it too. Man, if we're talking about all the networks are trying to find a way to recoup some of the dollars that have been missed out. If, well, I, I was going to say if he's not reelected, but he, what reelected or not, I'm, he's got time to golf. I, it shouldn't, isn't the obvious, the obvious next one, Brady and his buddy, Donald Trump against Steph and his buddy, President Obama. Like, is it would I would pay a Mike Tyson pay-per-view level costs to watch that. I, you, you tell me the dollar amount, mic them up, Brady and Trump, Steph and Obama, let's go. My first question on that, and it's a great idea, is do you think that they would broadcast that in Costa Rica? And I ask that because the second that match is scheduled, I'm moving. <laughs> it's over. This country cannot, this country could not withstand all the tension and turmoil that that would cause. I am out of here. I am. That would be the day that I realized maybe I could go to France, right? They seem to like us over there. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, get my Richard Wright on. I gotta go. Get my Richard Wright on. I gotta go. There's no way in the world I can stay here. If, if, if the possibility of that is out here in these streets, I am long gone. I will come kiss your daughter goodbye. I will dap y'all up. Y'all are welcome to come visit. In fact, y'all might want to come over here with me. I'm come with you. Now, y'all don't want to be here. Y'all don't. Y'all don't want to be here. Y'all go. Y'all go mess. Y'all gonna be getting harassed at dinner that day. You know how bad it is when we got a black dude and a white dude in a boxing match. The white dude ain't even got to be from America. Right? Doesn't even have to be from America, and he becomes the American favorite. That is that is a tale as old as time. That is true. Yeah, it would. I'd still though, man. I'd love to see it. I would just love to see it. I think it'd be great. I think. But you know, the problem is though, because you don't play golf. No, I don't. So the thing is, Trump cheats. That's that what would I hear. be the issue. Is that he cheats, and That's that would turn into a thing. That would be great. I could think of a few other issues <laughs> other than the fact that he's going to kick his ball out of the rough. But yeah, listen, man. I'm just saying. I feel like you could. I think you could pull a thirty share. If we put that in, you could put it on pay cable, and I think everyone in the world's tuning oh, in. Oh, actually, I got it. Yeah. Jordan Obama is the one that we want. Those two dudes with all the 
Did they talk to each other generally then out there on the golf course? Yeah, but if we know anything about Mike, I feel like Mike would, you know, just want to be middle of the road on this one. I don't feel like Mike wants to be, wants to pick a – you're saying yeah. Jordan versus Obama head-to-head? Yes. Head? Yes. Oh, I thought you meant Jordan replacing no. Steph as Obama's no. partner. No. Oh, that's a good one. That's Jordan, the one. Yeah, I feel like Obama's going to need a few strokes. Like, I don't know. I don't oh, know. Maybe not. Yeah, listen, he's had some time off. He's yeah. been chilling. And Mike can't let nothing slide. Mike can't – like, did you – I don't know if you remember this. This was a few years ago. Jordan did something with a mod, and it was some interview – and they asked, basically, uh, Jordan said that Obama couldn't play golf. And he said something. He's like, I ain't got nothing to say to him about it. no politician. I'm just saying he stinks at f- golf or something like that. And so they asked Obama about this, like, at a public briefing. And he just kind of chuckles it off. And he says, ah, yeah, you know. They, I forget, he goes along a little while. And he says, well, I just figure that Michael should be a little busy running the Bobcats. Oh, I'm sorry. The Hornets. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's why this is the one we need. By the way, I'm glad you brought up Ahmad Rashad. I get tweets every day, every day, accusing me of being on the clutch payroll, saying I'm in LeBron's <laughs> pocket, all these things. And while I have immense respect for Rich Paul and what he's done, I'm not even represented by the same agency that clutches under the umbrella. Of. I've never received a dollar from any of these folks. Meanwhile, Ahmad was riding to the games with Mike. <laughs> he was hanging out with the security guards, gambling with Mike. He was Mike's guy in every way, shape, or form while being the sideline reporter for the finals. I'm like, that is projection. What y'all say about me and Shannon Sharp is what Ahmad, in all respect to him, what Ahmad Rashad actually literally was doing. And we saw it firsthand. Yo, I, I, last thing I'll say on this, I, we, we try to get a mod on the show. I would like to do it a mod Rashad documentary because I don't think enough is made of the fact that this dude named Bobby Moore went Muslim in the seventies <laughs> as a pro bowl football player, like a legitimately great football player becomes the broadcast dude, marries Claire Huxtable becomes Michael Jordan's right-hand guy in the media, is like 70-something years old and looks amazing to this day. All of this stuff, like, how, first of all, how did you, with the name Ahmad Rashad, get this job in the first place? Yeah. And, and, and like, when he converted to Islam, like, he converted to Islam, like, the group of people he was kicking it with, they got a wiki page, you know what I'm saying? Like, this is an amazing art and voyage. That's going to be my wiki deep dive after this because I didn't know his – I knew he obviously converted to Islam. I knew his football career, but I didn't know all the full details. I know he's been you know, married post-Felicia Rashad. Yes. But, yeah, no, that's an, it's an amazing career arc, an amazing career arc for one Ahmad Rashad, who I thought came across actually pretty damn well in that doc. Yeah, yeah, man. Ahmad's like I – mean, think about this. Ahmad – at least, like, he had the interview with Jordan with the shades on. Ahmad conducted a real interview. Yeah, he did. Like, he did not conduct it like oh, he was his buddy. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. I have to say something about that because you have witnessed firsthand as much as any human being that's not a relative of mine, my gambling, yes. my sports gambling, yes. my betting. You witnessed my daughter, who's you're her best friend, and you're the greatest uncle in the world. You witness my daughter; she's six now. When she was four, walking into our Sunday football room and saying, "Daddy, who's our favorite team today?" Yes, which is a great <laughs> sign. Daddy might have a gambling problem. Um, and so I'm a guy that enjoys living and dying with some wagers. Michael's, I had totally forgotten that interview, or maybe I was just too young to understand the importance of it at the time. Michael's reasoning as to his, his evidence that he didn't have a gambling problem, that it was my family's not starving. It was, it was like, it was literally what, cause I maybe or maybe not have been to a few of those meetings. It's what you say if you are trying to deny a gambling problem. It's like, what do you mean? <laughs> I'm not out here bleep and bleep for bets. I'm not, oh, my family can still eat. What are you talking about? I'm, not, I'm, I'm like, man, I watched that. And I was like, 
Michael Jordan, I've never related to him more. I was like, I was like, Michael Jordan absolutely has woken up in the middle of the night having dreamt about a bet. And the first thing he thought about the next morning was a bet. I was like, I was like, you are not making a case as to not having a gambling problem, Mike. I don't begrudge you, but from, uh, you know, let me tell you right now, I relate to that and it's not the greatest defense I've ever heard. I got to say it worked on me. But ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> thanks so much for joining us here on The Right Time. We do this thing here a couple times a week. My man Gabe Bassane handles everything behind the scenes. Thank you, sir. Thank you to our sponsor, Blue Moon. Nick Wright, my man, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Absolutely, Bo. Thank you, man. It was a pleasure to be on. Do it again. All right, now, remember, subscribe to The Right Time. Rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to think you are a hater. We'll talk to you guys in a couple of days. Take it easy. Thanks for checking out The Right Time with Bomani Jones Podcast. You can listen or subscribe on the ESPN app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. The Right Time with Bomani Jones.